Hello, good evening and welcome everybody. Welcome to the Rothenberg Hall for this inaugural program in the Caltech Huntington uh, series in visual culture. My name is Steve Hindle. I'm director of research here at the Huntington and it's my duty to oversee the conference program, the fellowship program, and the lecture program. I really would like to thank you all for coming. This is the second consecutive night of our lecture series. A particular shout out to those of you who were here yesterday evening. Thank you. We really appreciate it. If I can be here on two successive nights, you can too. <laughs> Uh, so this program was developed between myself and President Tom Rosenbaum at Caltech just over a year ago when we bid to the Mellon Foundation to support a three-year initiative in visual culture at Caltech and the Huntington. It's designed really to do three things. First of all, to enhance dialogue between scientists and humanists at Caltech. Secondly, to expand the curriculum in visual literacies in the humanities and social scientists in the Division of Humanities and Social Sciences at Caltech, specifically by appointing a process that is underway at the moment, a faculty member in visual culture. And third, to bring greater recognition and visibility within and beyond Caltech and the Huntington of the Huntington's extraordinary collections of visual material in photography, the graphic arts, and the history of science and medicine. The program has several components, including artists in residence, a faculty position, as I've just explained, and several short-term visitors, which is where this evening's speaker comes in. And I'm really thrilled that we have such a distinguished inaugural speaker in our series. Sashiko Kusakawa is Professor of History of Science in the Department of History and Philosophy of Science at the University of Cambridge. Hooray! Where she's also a fellow and the Dean of Trinity College. She was educate, born and educated in Tokyo and in Cambridge. She went on to hold a junior research fellowship at Christ's College and has since held visiting positions in Munich, Berlin, Tokyo, Princeton, and at the Natural History Museum in London. She's the author of The Transformation of Natural Philosophy, the case of Philip Melanchthon, which appeared in 1995, a hugely influential second monograph called Picturing the Book of Nature, Image, Text and Argument in 16th Century Human Anatomy and Medical Botany, which appeared with Chicago in 2012, and co-editor uh, with Constance Blackwell of Philosophy in the 16th and 17th Centuries, Conversations with Aristotle, and with Ian McLean of transmitting knowledge, words, images, and instruments in early modern Europe. All of which is to say that over the last 20 years, she's developed a formidable reputation at the cutting edge of the analysis of visual representation of scientific ideas in 16th, 17th, and 18th century Europe. She's here this evening to deliver a talk entitled, With a Sincere Hand and a Faithful Eye, the visual culture of early modern science. Please welcome Sashiko Kusakawa. Thank you very much, Stephen, for that kind and generous introduction. And thank you very much indeed for the invitation for me to come here, affording me the opportunity to share with you some of the past scientific images that have fascinated me over the years. I'd like to also take a moment to also thank Catherine Worley-Miller, Worley who has um, made sure that I got here, and also Juan Gomez and Jason Duller, who made sure that the PowerPoint is more or less working today and calming me down this afternoon. I do apologize that some of the qualities of the images are um, not perfect, particularly the woodcuts, it's probably my incompetence, it is certainly my incompetence, rather than uh, the Huntington's um, wonderful equipment. I am a historian of science and have long been interested in how science became visual, perhaps something we take for granted in modern times. The title of my lecture, A Sincere Hand and a Faithful Eye, is taken from Robert Hooke, probably best known to you for his sumptuously illustrated book of microscopic observations, 
Micrographia, of which the Huntington Library has no fewer than four copies. You've probably seen this flea before. Now, um, the quote comes from the preface of the Micrographia, okay. and it reads thus, I here present the world my imperfect endeavours, which though they shall prove no other way considerable, yet I hope they may be in some measure they may be in some measure useful to the main design of a reformation in philosophy, if it be only by showing that there is not so much required towards it, any strength of imagination, exactness of method, or depth of contemplation, as a sincere hand and a faithful eye, to examine and to record the things themselves as they appear. Here, Hooke was saying that his book is a contribution to reforming natural philosophy, by conveying the things themselves as they appear, which is more useful than precise methods or deep thought. This looks like a strong endorsement of empiricism and observation that we associate with the modern scientific enterprise, which in many ways it is. But it would also be misleading to assume that scientific images in the past were 17th century equivalent of photographic snapshots of objects actually observed by past scientists. There were many other ways in which images became central to scientific investigation and communication in the past, which hinged on the malleability of images. Perhaps this point is not that strange in this digital age, thanks to tools such as Photoshop, I may be out of date here, but things like that, and computer graphics. Here is an example of how the Hubble telescope image of the Omega Nebula, or Messier 17, was created by adding colors which seem to have been chosen quite arbitrar arbitrarily and adjusting composition. In order to understand the work that went into the making of past scientific images, I find Hooke's phrase, a sincere hand and a faithful eye, helpful because it allows us to focus on who made the images, who was doing the observing, and how images and scientific knowledge came together. Towards the end of this lecture, I will be returning to Hooke, who, apart from being the nemesis of Isaac Newton, is known for his range of scientific interests and draftsmanship, and has been dubbed by various historians as London, London's Leonardo, or even England's Leonardo. Leonardo da Vinci is in fact the person with whom I'd like to begin, as his case will help introduce a few caveats when approaching historical images. Leonardo da Vinci is probably one of the most problematic figures of the Renaissance. As art historians will readily tell you, there has been a gap between the Leonardo promoted by galleries and popular culture of a lone genius ahead of his time and the academic scholarship by historians of art and culture who see and place him within the culture of his time. Today, I'll be drawing on the work of art historians as a way to raise some points about what we need to be aware of when looking at scientific images from the past. Leonardo was, of course, a talented artist with superb naturalistic techniques, but these skills were used to depict a range of objects. Some can be identified by modern scientists, such as this blackberry to your left. Others are too generic and can only be identified to your right as a tree. So we have to be a bit careful about the status of the objects depicted with naturalistic techniques of shading and modeling, visual cues which we have learned to interpret as realistic. This is certainly the case with his anatomical drawings, such as this one of a female body. Several modern um, anatomists um, have commented um, that there are problems with it, and I quote from one set of them. Okay? Much of the anatomy is fanciful, and some is certainly derived from that of animals, such as the tributaries of the superior vena cana, cava, the relative positioning and shape of the kidneys, the branding in the heart ventricles, and the arrangement of the branches of the aortic arch. And now you have to look at these bits. Okay. 
The two clearly delineated structures originating from a common attachment either side of the uterus are clearly a triumph of the imagination. <laughs> Mondino earlier described such horns of the uterus. Uh, Mondino, 13th century author, uh, had described such horns of the uterus. It is obvious that neither was taken from the life, but rather they represent an adding on to conform with contemporary written anatomy, anatomy and beliefs. This drawing, not taken from the life, should not be explained away as Leonardo's limited opportunities to dissect human bodies because the medieval church outlawed human dissection, since there wasn't such a prohibition, as scholars um, such as Catherine Park have been pointing out for some time. Dissection for forensic purposes and anatomical lectures using human cadavers at medical schools are known from the early 14th century, if not earlier. What this drawing shows is what Leonardo thought the inside of a pregnant female body ought to look like, based on his observation, knowledge garnered from books, and his imagination. It is a visual record of his thought process. Leonardo also experimented pictorially with ways to show the three-dimensionality of the body, for example, by reducing the muscles to the thin cord-like structures so that one could see how the muscles themselves interconnected with each other and also see through down to the bones and other structures underneath the muscles. He did not observe an actual human body with these cord-like muscles and hollowed out insides, According to the art historian Alessandro Nova, this was Leonardo's way of distilling the structures of the human body as three-dimensionally interconnected parts. So Leonardo's drawings illustrate two important points. First, that naturalistic techniques of de depiction could be supremely persuasive, but it does not prove the existence nor the direct observation of an object as depicted. Secondly, some of Leonardo's drawings fuse first-hand experience, book knowledge, and imagination, all of which contributed to his thinking visually about the structure of the body. Leonardo had intended to publish a book on anatomy, but as with many of his projects, it did not come to fruition. His drawings had limited circulation and thus little direct impact, impact on the course of scientific illustration in the next two centuries. His case nevertheless alerts us to the role of images other than being an early form of a photographic record of observed objects. In the rest of the lecture, I'd like to pursue this point through two examples from the 16th century and another two from the 17th. The two examples I have in mind from the 16th century are Leonhard Fuchs's book on plants and Andreas Vesalius's book on human anatomy, published within a year of each other. Both books are known for the illustrations, which were made using woodcuts. Printing by movable type had been introduced in Europe around 1450 by Gutenberg, and of course the Huntington Library has one of the rare uh, copies of Gutenberg's Bible. So by the time Fuchs and Vesalius were, were printing their books a, a century later, a technical know-how had been accumulated and the potential of the printed book was well recognized by authors. Woodcut images are made by the woodcutter cutting away the wood. The uncut part left proud is inked and becomes the lines printed on the page. Because it is an image in relief, a woodcut works well in a printed book where the fonts too are in relief. It is a natural choice for illustration in printed books of this period. Both books by Fuchs and Vesalius represent, represented Renaissance projects in that they were serious engagements with the works of ancient Greek authorities. In the case of Fuchs, Dioscorides, a Greek physician from the first century. In the case of Vesalius, Claudius Galen, another Greek physician working in second century Rome. Dioscorides promoted the idea of inspecting plants frequently using the phrase autopsia, seeing for oneself. Galen similarly promoted the importance of first-hand dissection, though he did not use the word autopsia so much. Thus, 
The woodcut portraits of Fuchs and Vesalius in their books both promote this classical idea of first-hand observation. So let me start with Leonhard Fuchs, after whom the plant fuchsia is named. He was a professor of medicine at Tübingen in Germany and published his book on medicinal plants in 1542. The plants in question were those mentioned by Dioscorides, and Fuchs tried to identify Dioscorides' plants with plants of his own time by matching their external features like leaves, shoots, buds, and flowers. Now, when we compare Fuchs's woodcuts with illustrations from a botanical book by Otto Brunfels published earlier, there is a stark difference. The woodcuts in Brunfels' book were based on drawings done by the artist Hans Weiditz, who was employed by the printer of the book, Johannes Schott, to go around Strasbourg and sketch some plants, which he did, quite literally, drawing them as he found them, with torn leaves, bent stems, and insect holes. These were rendered naturalistically using shading. In contrast, Fuchs wood, Fuchs's woodcuts never show plants with any blemish and are carefully staged it's staged so that both sides of the leaves are always shown, for example. He also mentioned that he instructed his art artists to use minimal shading. This was probably deliberate to show more clearly the detailed outlines of the parts of the plant, but it was also because he had a colored copy in mind. A colored version of his book highlights further that Fuchs's images of plants are composites, in that they show different colored flowers on the same bush, or show different stages of plant from bud, flower, and fruit across time on the same bush. Fuchs considered his images of plants to be perfect, and the Latin word he used for it was absolutissima. They showed a plant that contained all its stages and its species. It is not an individual plant found at a particular place or time, ravaged by insects or other things. It's a universalized plant that transcends time and place. This was an important point about scientific knowledge in this period, in that science was about generalized objects. So when Fuchs argued that his depicted plant had specific medicinal properties, he, he was making a point that every instance of the species would have those properties, not just a single specimen. So we might ask, why didn't Brunfels do the same? The answer is, has to do with the fact that it was the printer Schott who had hired Weiditz to do the sketches, and neither Schott nor Weiditz seemed to, be, seemed to worry too much about scientific arguments. And Brunfels certainly did not have control over the artist. Fuchs, in contrast, paid for his artists, and his book is unique, not only in naming, but also showing those craftsmen who worked on his book. Heinrich Fuhlmaurer drew the images, top left and top right, Albrecht Meyer transferred them onto the woodblock, and then Weit Rudolf Specklin, the chap at the bottom, is the woodcutter who cut them. This was a fairly standard process of making woodblocks but it is the woodcutter who was considered the creator of these images and was paid the most. In the absence of specialist scientific illustrators in the period, harnessing the talent of those graf these graphic craftsmen was one of the challenges scientific authors had to face. Apart from telling them to go easy on the shading, we don't, much know, about, we don't know much about how exactly Fuchs worked with these craftsmen. A contemporary, Conrad Gessner, a naturalist and another professor of medicine in Zurich, left some drawings that indicate what might have been involved. In this example of a dandelion, Gessner was unhappy with the way the artist had originally depicted, depicted the petals in the watercolor without serrated edges. And so he made a, top, a note to himself at the top right to get the painter back to redraw the petals but then the redrawn version then exaggerated the serrations in the middle of the petal. So he struck through the picture and got him to come back and do another sketch. 
the hand of the painter had to be guided by the eye of the observer. Quite a few naturalists of the time remarked that they needed to curb artistic license on the part of the graphic craftsmen to, focus, to get them to focus on some of the, the precise details. A year after Fuchs had published his botanical work, Andreas Vesalius, professor of surgery at Padua, published a work on human anatomy entitled Fabric of the Human Body. And I apologize for the graininess of, of, of this image. It is famous in the history of medicine for its superb woodcuts. Vesalius had paid for the images and exercised close control of them. We do not know the name of the artist involved. It certainly wasn't Titian, and one of them probably had the initials I.O. This title page shows a fictional stage scene of an academic dissection performed in front of a crowd of spectators. Vesalius explained that when he held such public anatomies, he would ignore any abnormalities or individual idiosyncrasies that might be found in a particular body so that students would not be misled from a perfect body, which he called corpus absolutus. Like Fuchs, Vesalius wanted to present a perfect idealized body. He also identified such a body in classical terms as the canon, which was the name of a sculpture made by Polycletus, regarded as the most accomplished sculptor of classical times. And it is, uh, so it was reported in, that in antiquity, Polycletus had made a statue called the Canna, which was so perfect that later all sculptors measure, tried to measure their own skills against it. It is perhaps a homage to Polycletus's canon that Vesalius embedded seminal structures onto the famous Belvedere torso, an antique sculpture that was then, as is now, displayed at the Vatican. Galen, too, used the idea of a canon to denote a perfect body, but he also said that such a body was rarely found in a single individual. So how did Vesalius establish a canonical, canonical human body? He followed Galen's advice, which was to dissect as many human bodies as possible. But he tempered this by adding, again following Galen, the need to determine function for each structure. The purpose for which a structure was made explained how the structure was shaped and placed. This is how Vesalius included in his uh, description of the bones of a hand a tiny bone at N under the little finger. This turns out to be a very rare structure, but medics in the audience will know it as the Os Vesalianum carpi. He's unlikely to have seen it more than once or twice in his lifetime, but he included it in the figure, uh, figure of the hand because he could find a purpose for it, that is, of keeping the little finger from slipping down. On the other hand, he omitted a muscle in the hand, the palmaris brevis to us, common to all humans, discovered earlier by Gian Battista Canani, because Vesalius could not determine a purpose for it. So, the importance of considering function over frequent dissection is illustrated by the fact that a rare bone becomes part of a canonical body and a common muscle was omitted from it. One of the side effects of Vesalius following Galen's advice, quite literally, of dissecting a human body, as, as many human bodies as possible, was that Vesalius discovered that Galen himself had not dissected that many human bodies and had made inferences from animal bodies. Here, in order to make this point, Vesalius embedded at O, gamma, P, Q, here, a muscle of a dog, to show that Galen's description of that muscle fitted a dog muscle better than a human one. So here Vesalius is using his illustration to defend his version of a canonical body against Galen. Vesalius's images also reflect some artistic conventions of the period, such as a melancholic skeleton contemplating a skull. Okay, okay. <laughs> 
Now, the muscle figure to your right in profile is possibly based on a painting by Titian. But more importantly, this pose allows Vesalius to describe quite efficiently the internal and external muscles of the arm and the leg in one go. Okay. Many of the muscle figures take the pose that art historians call the contrapposto, with the weight of the body placed on one leg and the other leg at the back counterbalancing the weight, as seen in many ancient sculptures. The contrapposto pose adds a slight twist to the torso, which also helped Vesalius show more parts of the body. The repeated use of the contrapposto pose was surely not just aesthetic, but deliberate in conveying a sense of con continuity when readers were looking through these images. They were actually looking at the same body through different layers. In this way, Vesalius was trying to convey the three-dimensional human body. Compared to Fuchs's plant, however, Vesalius's craftsmen deployed heavy and complex shading to model the structural details of the human body. Vesalius seemed to think that his readers might misunderstand artistic conventions, as he reminded his readers that in the figure to your right, the left arm, he said, might look shorter than the right arm, but that's, but that's because um, somebody isn't understanding perspective. This is what we'd call foreshortening. Okay. In the figure to the vein to your left, he pointed out that the shaded parts indicated veins that were further back from view. Okay. One of his most impressive figures is the figure made up entirely of veins. Using ample shading, the veins are presented as running through the entire breadth and depth of the body and even take the contraposto pose. Okay. And the impressive thing about this is there is no other supplementary outline. It's just the veins looking like a human body. Yet, for all these efforts, it appears that Vesalius felt the limitations of the two-dimensional page as he suggested that his readers cut out and glue images of organs onto another sheet to create a paper mannequin. This can be better seen in the companion volume to the Fabrica entitled The Epitome of the Fabric of the Human Body. Here you can see more spectacularly the pop-up human paper mannequin. And in fact, in the um, exhibition um, here at the Huntington, you, there is actually an interactive one that you can handle. Okay, which is quite impressive. Okay. So Vesalius was really pushing the medium of the two-dimensional paper um, in order to try and cope with a three-dimensional human figure. In these two 16th century examples of Fuchs and Vesalius, artistic skills were harnessed and exploited to present objects of scientific investigation, objects that transcended the particular or the individual. Images were a visual means of abstraction to present a scientific object of study which could not be found in an actual observation of a single specimen out there in nature. And in this way, images became an integral part of scientific knowledge. I'd now like to move on to discuss two examples from the 17th century involving new instruments of observation. The telescope in the case of Galileo Galilei and the microscope in the case of Hooke. In both cases, artistic training was key to their observation. Let me begin with Galilei. He was the first to publish observations made with a telescope. From December 1609 to January 1610, Galileo looked at the moon through his telescope of about 20 times magnification. This telescope had a very small field of view, so he would not have, been, have seen the entire surface of the moon in one go. His drawing in ink of the surface of the moon thus must have been compiled from multiple views. <coughs> Excuse me. When we compare Galileo's drawing with that of Thomas Harriot, who is credited with the first telescopic observation of the moon made in London on 26th 
of July 1609, you will see that Harriet drew the moon quite differently. Harriet's telescope has not survived, but it is believed to have been a similar power for magnification to Galileo's. So here are two people using similar instruments, looking at the same object around the same time, but visualizing what they saw very differently. As numerous historians have pointed out, this can be attributed to their different backgrounds. Galileo had artistic training, Harriet did not. When young, Galileo had received artistic and perspectival training in Florence at the Academy of Drawing Arts, Accademia delle Arti del Disegno, which would have included studying perspective. Knowledge of how complex bodies cast shadows and how such shadows moved as the light source changed was applied to his observation. As you can see in the detail of Galileo's sketch here, he worked out that a dark spot was depressed because of its darkness in relation to its surroundings and its rim catching light from the sun. Tracking these dark spots and bright rims as the moon's phases changed enabled Galileo to draw the conclusion that the surface of the moon was rugged, contrary to the belief that it was smooth. Galileo rushed to publicize his work and in a matter of six weeks, the Sidereus Nuncius or The Starry Messenger, was published in the spring of 1610. These included etched images of the surface of the moon. In engraving or etching, the incised part of the copper plate is inked and becomes the lines, which meant that additional pressure had to be exerted on the paper and plate to take the ink. So copper plate engravings were usually printed separately and inserted into a book. Printing engravings or etchings next to the text meant putting the paper through two different presses. And you can see how, in this case, the etching ended up encroaching onto the text. And this is a copy in the Huntington. But as the historian of book Paul Needham has shown, the mad rush to get published and the limitation of spa space meant that the seven images of the surface of the moon originally intended for the book were merged into five etchings, which explains why they don't correspond precisely to known phases of the moon. Moreover, scholars have noted the exaggerated details, details especially the crater in the middle, that cannot be identified with actual craters on the lunar surface. This crater, however, served as a striking visual parallel to Galileo's description in the text of the Valley of Bohemia, which he used to draw an analogy between the surface of the moon and the surface of the earth. So in his book, Galileo was more interested in the persuasive power of images than accuracy or precision of the kind sought by modern standards of astronomical observation. And it seems to have had an impact. A year later, in, in England, Harriet drew the moon again. This one. Okay. Scholars are agreed that Harriet had read Galileo's book by the time he made this drawing. So this would mean that Harriet learned to see the moon through the images in Galileo's book, including its exaggerated features. Printed images could thus act as a template for others to visualize objects. Galileo also devised a microscope around 1624, which he dedicated to his friend and patron, the nobleman Federico Cesi, who established an academy for the study of nature. Academy of Lynxes, who used it to look at some plant details. And here you see the word ex microscopio. Okay. This conveniently brings me back to Robert Hooke, with whom I began. Robert Hooke learned drawing from the miniaturist Samuel Cooper and then apprenticed with London's leading portraitist of the time. Peter Lilly, before he had to quit because the smell of oil paint gave him headaches, and thus began his scientific career. In 
Hook was a superb draftsman, as can be seen from this drawing of a number of ammonites, then called snake or serpentine stones, stones, which he drew in ink and ink wash. These are fossils of now extinct sea creatures, similar to the modern day Nautilus. But in Hook's time, the animal origin of fossils was not understood. Fossils were generally regarded as jokes of nature or random formations out of the soil via some form of petrification or crystallization. This drawing is a visual record of the individual specimens Hook had studied one by one. Hook pointed out that these were formed of different substances as to hardness, transparency, and color. Some looked like broken shells and even retained outward shells that could be separated and dissolved in vinegar in the way that shells of shellfish could be. Others had suture patterns like leaves, which corresponded to the boundaries of the internal diaphragms, what we would call septa. And the cavities between the diaph diaphragms were sometimes filled with clay or other kinds of substances. The cavities are shown as line drawings, like here, okay. And also uh, the, the sutures that he saw under microscope are also added to the picture. By putting all of the individual specimens on a single page, Hook was also making a synoptic point. There was a general morphological pattern in all of this, in that they all had tapering bodies that coiled up with their tip in the center and that the axis of the coiling was on one plane. His conclusion was that the formation and the figuration of these stones were not due to any random formative power in the soil, but could be explained as shells of animals that had become filled with mud and had over time rotted away, leaving the impressions both on the containing and contained substances. Hook was one of the few people to suggest the animal origin of ammonites. He made this suggestion in the Micrographia, but without this figure, probably because the book was already in print, but possibly because this was a contra controversial point. His drawings and his, his full views about the animal origins of fossils were only published after his death. The Micrographia was a lavish, lavish publication ordered by the Royal Society for the King, Charles II. From, the, from spring 1663 to the summer of 1664, Hook submitted to the weekly meetings of the society his own drawings of microscopic observations for approval by the society, but virtually none of his drawings has survived. You will notice from this title, Physiological Description of Minute Bodies Made by Magnifying Glasses, that he doesn't, in fact, use the word microscope on the title page. But fear not, he did use microscopes, as he showed here um, in the illustrations. He actually used both a compound microscope and the single lens Leeuwenhoek type microscopes for observation. <coughs> the plates of micrographia are a combination of engraving and etching, but we do not know who the engravers were. Several of the um, illustrations were printed on paper much larger than the page of the book. This necessitated a form of insertion that allowed the paper to be folded. So for example, when a reader got to the description of a louse and turned the page, they first could not see, oops, what happened here? Sorry. They first could not see the illustration, which had to be manually unfolded and to reveal an image of a louse half a meter long. And this must have been a deliberate design decision to surprise and impress the reader of a microscopic world not seen before. The impressiveness of the size was not lost on Hook's contemporary. One of the few remarks made by Michael Graffier by, um, by the Dutch contemporary scientist Christian Haugens was that the flea was the size of a small cat. 
the images, though many of them were set, or of micrographia, though many of them were set in a circle to simulate the field of vision of a microscope, they were not snapshot views of a single observation. For example, the three-dimensional um, globules of the Kettering stone okay, would not have been visible in such crisp detail from one look through a microscope. The focus of the microscope at the time was very shallow, so it needed to be adjusted several times to capture a three-dimensional shape. In fact, Hooke explained that he did not start making a drawing until he had seen an object multiple times by varying the direction of light. This was necessary, he said, in order to determine whether the black and white elements on the surface of an object were patterns or not. And this... and. This is uh, what he said, and towards the um, end of this quotation, I'll, um, he explained more precisely, I never began to make any draft before, by many examinations in several lights and in several positions to those lights, I had discovered the true form. For it is exceeding difficult in some objects to distinguish between a prominency and a depression, between a shadow and a black stain, or a reflection and a whiteness in the color. In other words, though staged as if it were a view an observer would have with a single glance at an object through a microscope, these images in micrographia were a result of multiple observations. In one instance, Hooke represented his observational process, and this was with respect to the shape of the small eyes, we call them receptors, in the eye of a fly. And it is, I mean, you will have to see it to believe it, but every single one of them actually have these, these lines to make it clear that these are domed, um, domed structures. A year before the publication of Micrographia, another fellow of the Royal Society, Henry Power, had described the eye of the fly as being covered with small eyes, but dimpled, that's to say, sunken. Hooke determined correctly that the shape was domed, like, a, like half a sphere. Because another respected colleague had said otherwise, Hooke probably felt the need to justify himself. He wrote that the spherical shape of the surface was established by the reflection of the two windows in his room, which he showed in an illustration. These reflections confirmed the shape and texture of the small eyes of the fly. As many of you will know, reflection of windows was an artistic device used frequently in Dutch still life painting of the time to indicate the shape and texture of an object. Here it is significant then that Hooke had earlier been apprenticed to Lily, who was originally Dutch and a leading collector of Dutch still life painting too. Hooke was most certainly familiar with this artistic convention. In fact, uses of reflection of windows in the eye goes well back to Albrecht Dürer in his portraits here of his friend, really about Pirkheimer, but also in this lovely hair. So here, Hooke is using a well-known artistic convention for visual proof that his dedu deduction of the shape of the receptors in the fly's eye was correct. Okay. The examples of Galileo and Hooke indicate how their artistic training in understanding light and shadow was key to their observational practice. Being able to draw made them see better. Once again, images in their printed works were not snapshots of their actual observations. They are compilations and the result of a process of multiple observations, while exaggerated features of the moon or very large images of tiny creatures were strategies to impress an audience. I hope the examples I've discussed today have shown how images became a critical part 
of scientific investigation in 16th and 17th century Europe. Images constituted a malleable and versatile medium that offered a means of transcending the singular and creating a universal object of knowledge. And they offered many ways, such as shading, poses, coloring, pop-ups, exaggerated details, supersizes, and reflections, with which to impress and persuade an audience. In an age where there was no such thing as a specialist scientific illustrator, Scientific authors relied on existing graf crafts, graphic craftsmen, modifying and adapting their graphic skills to train their hand, or as Hooke would say, to train a sincere hand. In turn, some of the investigators of nature began to draw themselves in the 17th century. Their ability to draw sharpened their ability to observe, or as, or as Hooke would have it, it made their eyes more faithful. Today, I focused on images in historical scientific works to show how and why it became fundamental to European science to become visual by utilizing the skills and conventions available in the wider visual culture of the time. Science, in turn, could contribute to this wider visual culture by offering train, pardon the quality of the image, and by offering training for artists okay, or artistic mot motifs in other media, from a, an ivory shrine into a silver salt dish. Or indeed, my favorite, pardon the quality of the image, um, the, this is the a rugged moon of Galileo under the feet of Virgin Mary, painted by his friend Ludovico Cigoli in a fresco in a papal chapel in Rome. I've resisted talking about historical scientific images in terms of science and art, because the two are ultimately inseparable, and they are symbiotically interconnected. And this connection, I believe, is much better appreciated when we examine them together under the wider category of visual culture. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Sashiko. So we have time for questions. Our experience in this room is that if you shout your question out, you can be heard, but we will endeavor to repeat it from the podium if there is any doubt. Are there questions? Uh, uh, yes, sorry. So the question is whether he only did uh, male dissections. Um, I, I'm just trying to see, um, is Monique? Um, you're, you're there. So we have an art historian specialist, so, so maybe you can, you can, you know the answer to this. Do we know exactly? Would you like to stand and shout? This is uh, uh, Dr. Monique Cornell. But, but some of them were female. He did, she did, he did uh, dissect female bodies. Yep. Yep. Hi there, Sam. Uh, about a decade ago, I went to a flower show in Japan, and the chrysanthemum plants were grafted so that there were many different colors of flowers on the same plant. Is it possible that in Fuchs' time, some gardener had figured out how to graft? <laughs> <laughs> Um, interesting question. I do not believe that was the case. <laughs> it was for me. <laughs> the gentleman over in the corner was 
more of the education in general for a, 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 a scientist or whatever, or a natural philosopher about dying? The ability to draw wasn't necessarily uh, an essential quality for being a, a, a natural philosopher at the time. In many ways, I think somebody, um, people like Galileo and Hooke are the exceptions. I mean, Martin Rudwick, um, who is a historian of geology, um, told me that when he was training in the 60s as a geologist, they actually had to draw. And, and drawing was part of knowing, knowing your specimens. And so drawing must have become part of a scientific um, training at some point, but I, don't, um, I actually don't know when it happened, some, sometime between 17th century and the 20th century, but that doesn't really help, does it? <laughs> Yes, yes, some skill, yes. Yeah. Uh, was the use of drawing or visual used to uh, perpetuate the focus of scientific study? Sorry, can, 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 can you repeat the question again? So, so the, the use of visual art for yeah. graphics mm -hmm. in a scientific study, was that used to kind of emphasize or provide uh, to get patrons to further the study of a particular science, anatomy or uh, botany or was it? Right, yeah. <coughs> oh, certainly, uh, Vesalius's anatomical book, I mean, which is huge and lavishly illustrated is dedicated to the Emperor Charles V, and which he then gives to Charles V. And I think two months later, he, he becomes imperial physician. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> yes. So can I push you on the closing argument? You argued that the ability to draw affected natural philosophers' mm -hmm. observational practice. Mm -hmm. I can see that it affected their representational practice. How specifically does it affect their observational practice? Uh, very good question. Okay. Now the question is, as historian of si historians of science, what kind of evidence do we have of anybody's observational practice? Mm. Only what they represent. Or only what's on sort of scratches or on paper. Right. In that sense, we are limited. In, in what we can find as evidence, right? I, mean, I think later on there may be uh, scientists become a bit chattier about what they're actually doing, and so you get things like, oh, I thought I was looking at this, but I didn't see it, or there are more kind of notebooks which might indicate sort of trial and error more, more, more carefully. But in this period, um, evidence is few and far between, so we tend to go with what we've got, I'm, I'm afraid, yes. Just a comment, uh, in my uh, effort to get a little more educated in art, you know, I was trying to upgrade my doodle, my doodle ability, and I found that looking at a building or something and trying to draw or even a painting, it increased my observation of the painting itself and in the details. And it, in other words, I can, use it, I can use it today as an observational tool, which, uh, you know, which was kind of a, a new thing for me. But I can understand what you're saying there. Thank you. Any last comments? versus a specific observation of an individual species. 
Uh, yes, so the question was um, what advantage or disadvantage um, um, there is between an image which is a kind of all-encompassing sort of everything universalized object and then um, having just specific individual specimens. In printed works, I'd say there's a financial dimension to it in terms of how much you can pack in to one image. So, so economy or, of representation, I think, might come to it. Um, then there is an issue of um, what an individual specimen stands for. Okay. If an individual specimen stands for, say, a kind of generalized law, then you just only need one specimen. But I think if you look at some, what, what Hook did with the Ammonites, for example, he is actually showing, you know, he actually says where each specimen comes from. And, and in fact, that is a bit unusual because you think this is empiricism, but how many more was he going to do? Because the, the problem with the, uh, the standard Aristotelian definition of induction is you have to enumerate every single instance of a class to be able to make a generalization, generalization of that class. Now, we all know that is not impossible. So at some point, you have to, you know, after you've done quite a few, you're going to guess, guess and make a, some kind of generalized comment, right? So um, there must have been, uh, so, but something like Ammonites, where the status of, of those objects are actually uh, contested, it may be something that you might want to go for a one-by-one -one approach, if that makes any sense. Are we done? We are. So we'll call it a day there. Thank you all for coming. Thank you for our, your consistent support of our programs. Please join us outside for coffee and cookies, and please join me in thanking Sashiko Kusakawa.